Before we start this second session of the eighth virtual Widening the Pipeline Fellowship training, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation, Bayer, Lenovo, Johnson & Johnson, and Twitter. Our next speaker, Professor Christopher Chavez, is here to challenge us about a central question. How important is it to hear people who sound like you as reporters and hosts on your local public radio station? He is director of the Center for Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies at the University of Oregon. And he's also the author of the book, The Sound of Exclusion, NPR and the Latinx Public. And he's here today to share some insights with the Widening Fellows. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We like to ask each of our speakers to sort of give us some background into their own careers and how they became involved in journalism. So before we get into your presentation, why don't we start there? Sure. Um, you know, I grew up in Southern California. Um, I went into actually a field of advertising. And so I worked in advertising for about 10 years and then went to graduate school in the University of Southern California. Um, and uh, Southern California, for those of you who, who come from that area, is a pretty unique laboratory. It's primarily a Latino city. Um, and so there's kind of a very rich culture there. Um, I'm teaching right now in the School of Journalism Communication. So one of my students will go on to become practitioners. They'll go on to become uh, broadcast producers, uh, radio practitioners, uh, newspaper practitioners. And so um, and I see sort of the changes that they go through when they start to go into the field, find their ways into it, um, and seek out the possibilities. And so, um, so yeah, so the, the book was really kind of drawing on some of those experiences. You know, when I think of NPR, I often think of that Saturday Night Live parody uh, where the the uh, pretend hosts have this low, right. measured sort of lullaby voice, and this is how they spoke. And if I recall from our first conversation, the book came from an experience that you had. Uh, you were helping to hire someone for the local station. Can you yeah, uh, recall that and then get into your presentation for us. Yeah, definitely. So I was, uh, you know, kind of how I came to this book project. It was around 2016. Uh, this one was uh, Donald Trump was becoming a candidate. Uh, and I was in a meeting in our local NPR station, our affiliate here in Eugene, Oregon. Um, and the fact that Trump was coming to Eugene to give a talk was pretty curious. I mean, we're pretty, you know, we're a college town in a pretty blue state. Um, but I was really interested in how the news director really handled it. Uh, he said, we're going to treat him just like we're going to treat any other candidate, you know, sort of that journalistic objectivity approach, which to me, you know, not being a journalist and not coming from the journalistic field seemed curious. After all, he was anything but a normal candidate. And by that time, had said some things that were pretty racialized. Uh, I would even say racist. Um, and over time, just became frustrated with how uh, the general news media covered Trump, especially in those early days. Uh, it took him about two or three years, at least for NPR, to describe what he was saying as as racist, and so just sort of why why that is, you know, what are the practices that sort of uh, don't allow us to call things out when it, when they become very apparent, um, and so you know, with that, I'd love to just sort of jump in into the project if that's okay. Great. And please let me know if you could see this. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, and so you know, it, it over the course of four years, really kind of went into this area. The book came out last year just around the time that NPR was wrapping up its 50th year anniversary. Uh, and it kind of promoted itself around the idea of hear every voice. That was the tagline that they surrounded, um, which there's something beautiful about that concept, right? There's something promising about being able to include every kind of voice and all its beautiful range, uh, which is what we have in the country. Um, at the same time, it doesn't necessarily do that. And so I was really interested in sort of the inconsistencies between how NPR has positioned itself over time and its actual broadcast practices. And so to kind of give you an example, uh, this would be a typical story of what NPR would do, you know, how they would tell a Latino story. Um, so I'll play a, a little bit of the um, uh, of a segment on Jeff Sessions. This is produced in 2018, talking about Trump's zero border policy or zero tolerance border policy. And it's pretty indicative of how NPR covers stories like these. separated. NPR's John Burnett covers the border. He's in our studios. John, good morning. Good to see you. 
really. Mm. That's triple the number from last year in the same month. And what complicates this is that many of the crossers were families with small children, asylum seekers who say they're fleeing criminal violence in Central America. And so the Trump administration has been threatening for months to impose really severe measures to stop this migration of families. And that's what Sessions announced yesterday. If you're smuggling a child, then we're going to prosecute you. And that child will be separated from you, probably, as required by law. Uh, if you don't want your child to be separated, then don't bring them across the border illegally. So, so that kind of gives you a sense. That would be a pretty typical way in which um, uh, in which the, the NPR would kind of cover a story like this. Um, one of the things that I think becomes interesting is, is kind of picking a path, but like whose voices you hear and whose voices you don't hear. Uh, in theory, you have a story about Latinos, uh, but it's told primarily by white men, right? Uh, so you have Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General. Uh, you have John Burnett, who's the local correspondent. Steve Inskeep, who's the host of Morning Edition. All of these stories, um, you know, told in English. Uh, whose voices don't you hear? Um, you don't hear the voices of the actual people impacted by the policies themselves. Uh, you don't hear the voices of advocacy groups or humanitarian groups that are on, you know, on the field. Uh, locally. Um, you don't hear them speaking in the languages that would be common to this region, languages like Mam, Quiche, Gonombe, any of the Mayan languages that would be typical here in addition to Spanish. Um, so it kind of tells you stories about like who actually controls whose voices get to be heard. And that was sort of the, the ongoing um, kind of query that I have. I think the second thing that that I think it's indicative of, um, which is really kind of two things. One is is it represents um, NPR's long march towards linguistic uniformity, one way of speaking uh, in language in the conventional sense, meaning English, but also a very specific dialects, Rachel, that as you noted. And then the second is the framing, you know, just caught in this perpetual cycle of, of framing Latinos as immigrants, perpetual immigrants, either framed according to their criminality or their economic viability. These didn't seem to be dominant tropes within uh, the journalism industry in general. Um, and so that was kind of the question that prompted so much of this this study, you know, and, and over time, you know, was this what it was meant to be? You know, we have this product uh, right now um, that is pretty dominant and pretty influential. And so my questions going into it is, was what was NPR originally meant to be? Uh, what has it become over time? And how is it changing in response to a public that is becoming more racially, ethnically and linguistically diverse? Uh, knowing that by the year 2050, you know, we're going to be entering the post-white generation. Uh, meaning that people of color are going to represent the majority. And so how are these large institutions, journalism institutions, changing uh, with these kinds of, of demographic and technological changes? Um, so I think some of these findings could apply to different kinds of groups. The focus of this study was, was on NPR, uh, which raises some unique considerations, and then it was focusing on U.S. Latinos. And so why NPR? Um, well, when it's a publicly funded radio station, the country's largest publicly funded radio station, so I think that framing gives it almost unique claims about what it means to be American, uh, what stories are considered American stories, but also who gets to be American um, by nature of who gets to be included or not included. Um, you know, again, I think some of these findings could apply to different kinds of, of groups of color, um, but I think that you know there are probably some things that that make this group singular. Uh, one is the issue of language uh, and linguistic proficiency. Um, many Latinos speak Spanish uh, or are bilingual. So there's a, a different kind of linguistic range. Uh, and then second, just sort of the constant uh, specter of citizenship, you know, no matter how long our residency may be in the United States, uh, no matter the fact that, that many parts of the country were once, you know, owned by Spanish speaking countries, um, Latinos are still considered newcomers, you know, perpetual immigrants, uh, you know, not quite American. So exploring that issue of citizenship. So to dive into this topic, you know, just to give you kind of a sense of, of the background research that I did is, is really looking at the founding documents, you know, where did NPR come from? What framework was it built on? Um, in addition to um, some of its current practices, things like style guides, things like, um, you know, editorial standards, uh, mission statements, um, things like that, that are very, very codified ways of telling you how you should write in the NPR voice, uh, what words are appropriate in the NPR voice, uh, what kind of stories are considered appropriate, since they kind of dictate what we hear, they set the preconditions for it. And then finally, interviews with uh, practitioners over time, um, including uh, Bill Seemering, uh, who was, um, you know, the, the architect of, of NPR when it first came out. He wrote the original mission statement, uh, in addition to practitioners um, 
you know, that are currently at NPR. I think people were pretty generous with their time and pretty open. So uh, I am thankful for, for the work that they did. So I'll organize kind of the findings into three main sections. And, and um, again, please feel free to reach out if, if you have any, um, any questions going into this. Uh, but one is the issue of audience and audience construction, and specifically around the question of like, well, who exactly is the public in public radio? You know, NPR is a, a network that purports to represent the nation. Um, and is that true? You know, does it, re you know, represent the broad diversity of the nation or does it actually focus on one narrow audience? And this audience, uh, idea of audience construction almost, again, sets the standards for what kind of stories you tell, how you tell them, in what language you tell them, what sort of framing that you put in it. Now, when you read the original mission statement for NPR, um, it's beautifully written and it's wonderfully exclusive. You know, it uses languages like when NPR uh, promote broadcast, you're going to hear, you know, many dialects, many different kinds of voices. It's going to respect the individual of humanity. Um, so the mission and statement itself, um, you know, was pretty lofty. Um, and again, wonderfully inclusive. That was what it was meant to be. Um, I spoke with Bill Seamery. I wanted to know, like, well, this is what you wrote in 1970. Has this become what you imagined it would be? Um, and to some degree, he's still kind of married to the idea of NPR. You know, he 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 thinks that it has, um, but I, I think some of the findings may con conflict with what he's saying. But anyways, um, you know, what becomes clear in sort of the original architectural documents and uh, the mission statement is that really NPR is meant to include two mandates. Uh, one that it would serve a broader, more inclusive definition of the public, uh, not just the affluent, not just the rich. These were people that are actually left out of civic discourses, not people that are already included in civic discourses. At least that's how it was imagined. Um, and then second, it would engage civic lis uh, listeners publicly and civically, meaning that he imagined a really active participant, uh, people that as a result of listening to public radio might engage their state governments or their local governments or their federal governments. Um, and so you could take a more active view. Um, again, both of these have changed over time, uh, but that was originally what the mission statement of NPR was. Um, but almost almost immediately, NPR does not become that thing, right? It becomes almost the, the opposite of that thing. And part of this is, is due to some of the financial pressures. And so within the first couple of years, the Carney Commission, who really kind of set up NPR, um, you know, identifies diversity as being a problem. Uh, seven years into the network's life, uh, it becomes a real issue. And so the Task Force for Minorities in Public Broadcasting um, goes out and issues kind of an 18-month eight study um, and issues a report called A Formula for Change, uh, the report on the Task Force for Minorities in Public Media. Um, and they issue a scathing report of NPR and what they've been doing. Uh, they describe the network as being asleep at the transmitter, you know, under underfunding programs for people of color, uh, not having enough minority ownership, uh, lack of, of uh, journalists uh, in these areas. And so it identifies kind of deficiencies on multiple levels. And for a short while, NPR attempts to address this. And so they established the department's specialized audience shortly afterwards. Uh, this was meant to create programs that were specifically for people of color. Uh, one of the programs that came out of this effort is a program called Enfoque Nacional, uh, which was a Spanish language program um, that was produced out of a uh, San Diego radio station that, that ran at the national level. But then within the, a couple of years, NPR just changes that perspective. Um, and a lot of these have to do with the financial pressures. And, and again, some of these are unique to NPR, but some of them might be um, issues that, that your own institutions are facing. You know, at the end of the day, these things are, are businesses uh, or they operate according to a business model. Um, and in some ways, they make decisions that will change the, the nature of the kind of programming that they see themselves delivering to the public. And so they hire a bunch of researchers that go out, and then market research uh, in particular, uh, that go out and try to understand, like, okay, who should we be speaking to? And they're very apparent. And when you look at these strategic documents, NPR is very apparent that they want to identify people that are when already listening to NPR, highly educated, highly connected significant amounts of cultural capital. Uh, but most importantly, they have money. Uh, they have money that they can support the, the program on a continuous basis. Um, and so they're upfront about that. They say, you know, here's a quote from uh, one of the reports. Programming is a lot like bait. What we catch depends on what we set out. Honey draws bees, worms lure fish, a hunk of liver will bring stray cats to your door. In the same way, certain kinds of listeners are attracted to certain kinds of programming. And so we choose what to air. We select who will listen and also who want. 
And so there's there's kind of an interesting pivot from basically creating program for the public at large, uh, the belief that that was way too unwieldy, and targeting their programming for a very specific narrow audience. And so the question becomes like, well, who is that audience? What do they look like? And here they kind of turned, and, and again, this is interesting because it's public media turning to the commercial world and drawing on their practices. So this idea of kind of market segmentation, where you take the population of the whole, um, and then you lop off a specific segment that is your intended target um, with the idea that you can efficiently use resources or speak to them in a more focused kind of way. Um, and so that's what they turn to. Uh, let's see if I can give you a sense of who they were speaking to. Um, so there's almost kind of three steps to this process that NPR goes through is, is one is the need to justify uh, this decision, because up until that point, um, NPR was meant to serve the, the broader public, you know, to speak to different kinds of audiences and to be more inclusive. And here they're making the, the concerted effort to say, no, we're going to peak to a very special, narrow audience. Um, and so they're positioning it as basically being efficient, uh, more practical. Uh, that it's unrealistic to think that you could speak to multiple audiences in multiple languages. Uh, they're really trying to kind of justify this. But who is their target? So their target were people, again, that were people that were already listening to NPR, what they called actualizers and fulfilled. These are people that are highly energetic. They're highly engaged in their communities. They have money. Uh, there are, um, you know, they have the resources, the time to actually be involved. And so that's who NPR identified as their target audience. Um, and then they, they've really never deviated from this target audience um, since then. Um, they may call them different things and they may use kind of different constructs for them, but for all intents and purposes, this is the NPR audience. Um, and then how do you justify that? And NPR shifts the way that they think about their audience and they think about their programming as it relates to this audience. Uh, and they kind of position it as a difference between a strategy of targeting and a strategy of transcendence. So a strategy of targeting would be like, creating programming for Latinx audience or for African-American audiences, which they thought was actually divisive. Um, instead, they wanted a, a strategy of transcendence by targeting basically, again, upper educated uh, social uh, economic class individuals. Uh, but by capturing those people, you're be actually being a little bit more inclusive. Um, and so again, it's kind of subverting some of the, the language of the civil rights discourse. And so the, again, all of those set the preconditions of, of what we see um, and listen to an NPR. Uh, the other area that I wanted to focus on, which I think is more relevant to probably what you've been talking about so far, is the issue of voice uh, and whose voices get to be heard. And again, this long uh, march towards linguistic uniformity. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, there was a, a scholar NPR practitioner as well, Chenjerai Kumanika, um, who um, wrote a really beautiful piece about the voice. Uh, and he talks about working in NPR and producing a piece for NPR um, and listening to his own voice. And all of a sudden, as he's listening to his own voice, it becomes unfamiliar to him. It's not the voice that he speaks in in his everyday life. It's not the voice that he speaks in with his friends. He's modeling it off of current NPR voices. And he says it's kind of disassociating for him. It's not how he speaks. Uh, and so he wrote very thoughtfully about it. And so um, I had an opportunity to interview for him um, him for this book. Uh, and he provided some really interesting insights about his experiences uh, at NPR and how his voice was shaped to speak in a very particular way that that was not his voice uh, and how he felt about that. Um, and so we we had a kind of a, a really fascinating conversation. That kind of whole issue of whose voice do we speak in is, is pretty um, kind of representative of conversations in radio. Um, and so especially in public radio. And so at the very uh, advent of, of radio in the 1920s, BBC was really kind of the first to deal with this. And so they have kind of a geographic region in which people speak with very, very different kinds of accents, depending on the village that you come from uh, or the city that you come from or the township, um, but you have one broadcast. And so whose voice is gonna represent the entirety of that nation? Uh, when BBC did it, they focused on the most elite. And so their early broadcast standard was, was called British Received Pronunciation, sort of that very patrician way of speaking that you think about when you watch kind of uh, old movies about British aristocrats, right? And, and they went about kind of using that model as the voice. When NPR started, they started with a very different kind of standard, uh, which was they were gonna be much more democratic. Uh, they weren't gonna be as patrician as the BBC was. Um, and originally their vision was to include a wider range of voices. And so the second piece that I wanted to show you was um, 
a piece from All Things Considered, the very first All Things Considered um, that is now several decades old. Um, when I was speaking with Chen Dry, he had mentioned, he's like, you know, it wasn't always this way. Listen to that first episode. The very first voice you're going to hear is a Black nurse. Um, and then you're going to hear multiple voices, right? And so check that out. And sure enough, I went back there and uh, indeed it is rich. And so I'm going to play you just a, you know, a short one minute segment. And what I want you to kind of take in is just the rich diversity of voices that you hear. Um, and then we can unpack it just, just a little bit. So this is from 1971. And the area of the... And just as sort of a quick background, like the entire segment, it runs about 30 minutes long. It's all focused on protests around the Vietnam War. So that's the context. Uh, Jeff Kamen is the correspondent. Uh, he's somebody that I had a chance to interview. Um, but most of it was really designed to get capture man on the street voices. Of the Washington Monument. Lots of tear gas. I was with this one kid who was busted, right? And he walked into a police car clean. His face was clean, right? I'm sitting here now, handcuffed behind his back. We walked in here now, police ambulance, blood all over his face and blood. He couldn't move. And we saw this kid walk into a car clean. But what happened to you? Well, then well, I was car. by DuPont Circle and, and like we was peaceful. This pig gonna jump out the, out the car and, and start beating on us. And then. So again, the entire piece runs about um, you know thirty minutes long. I think two things that have happened since then, at least on broadcast radio and specifically on NPR. Um, you know, one is the idea of a thirty-minute segment on a single piece is is unthinkable. I think by today's standards, uh, over time, these segments have become shorter and shorter and shorter. And I think there's sort of a compulsion that, gosh, if you kind of disrupt the listening experience in any kind of way, if you insert an accent or something that is not part of the NPR standard you're going to lose the listener. And so there's they've been truncated. What that means, because you've had a shorter time to tell a story, is that they've relied more heavily on expert sources, uh, government officials, professors, people that speak and are fluent in sort of standard American English. You're going to have less likely to hear, again, people that speak in, in regional dialects or ethnic dialects. Um, and so that is kind of a, a, a trend that has happened over time. And over time, I found that NPR has become uh, more and more conservative and orthodox in how they they use voice, and this does seem to be something that is specific to um, to public radio rather than commercial radio, like sports radio. Here, there's much more of a different kind of voice that can be used. Um, you know, uh, music certainly uh, you have greater linguistic range, but on public radio, it tends to be a very very narrow dialect. Um, and so, kind of the the kind of the the theory behind this is is one that you know, as Rachel mentioned, you know, there is a distinct voice. You know, if you can parody it chances are you have a very distinguished, identifiable voice in the marketplace. Uh, and in this case, it's that very steady, monotone, meant to be uh, kind of devoid of any kind of regional accent, uh, any kind of ethnic accent. Um, and in some cases, I don't know if, if others feel the same, it, it sounds robotic. You know, it's almost like you're not listening to, to people at all that come from distinct places uh, because it is sort of so neutralized. Um, but what that does, you know, even though it's meant to be neutral, um, there are some erasures involved, right? You, but whose voices don't you hear? You don't hear the voices of Puerto Ricans or Chicanos or Southerners uh, very often. You don't hear the voices of stigmatized groups, uh, something that we would call like a, a, a language ideology, right? There's something about the process that excludes certain kinds of voices and favors others. Um, you know, how is this specifically enacted in NPR? You know, there are both informal mechanisms and formal mechanisms. Um, informal ways is that you know, by the time that students walk into a door and apply for an internship, uh, they've probably been groomed in a system that has already taught them to speak in a particular way, um, regardless of, of their background. Otherwise, they don't get those jobs. And so they go through training programs like, like ours, frankly, at my university. And I see students' voices changing, you know, how they perform um, be behind the mic rather than how they perform, um, you know, with their friends or with their teachers, right? Something happens in that process where they begin to self-correct. Uh, one of the more interesting trends that um, that you may have confronted is just the a lack or the uh, the degree of feedback that now people can get on stories almost immediately from the public. And so it's not sort of NPR policing these all the time. Sometimes it's the audience, you know, uh, denigrating somebody because they uh, pronounce somebody's name with an ex ethnic accent or say words like Mexico City versus Mexico City. Um, and so you find ways that people really kind of discipline it. And sometimes it comes from the audience themselves. 
And then beyond that, there are things like style guides, voice coaches, editors and producers, uh, time limitations that we've talked about. Uh, all of these kind of indicate that there's probably going to be a specific way of speaking. And again, the, the motivation here is that there's clear communication and that you don't lose the audience. There's a palpable fear. Um, and so there's um, kind of there was an opinion piece by one of the ombuds person that they basically said, you know, we don't say the word Paris, we say Paris. You know, Paris might be the way that you might say it in French, um, but that would confuse listeners. Uh, they're uh, they're not equipped to kind of understand that. Um, so you have to say Paris because it's just much more of a seamless transition for them. But, you know, in speaking to everybody, there was just a pal palpable fear that you would lose the listener and they'd go somewhere else. Um, so these are sort of the, the critiques of the standards. I did see also some, um, some possibilities. You know, there have been examples within the network's 50 year anniversary of programs that have done pretty well, you know, and so the case studies that I use in the book were Latino USA, Radio Ambulante, and Latino. Um, each of these kind of share some commonalities. Um, there's some differences too, but they have managed to work within the public radio system and the system set up by NPR to their own advantage. And I think collectively, you know, they demonstrate the ways in which Latino cultural producers have at times negotiated the NPR system to their advantage. Um, they tell good stories. Um, they are thoughtful. Um, they, um, they hire uh, Latino journalists. Uh, they provide them with opportunities. Uh, and they do excellent work. So I think those of these are pretty good examples. Um, and to varying degrees, they've taken advantage of changes in the marketplace, technological changes, political changes, commercial changes. Uh, each one kind of has a, a different story, but Radio Ambilante would be um, a really good example of that. It came up during the podcast era when you could create a, a piece with relatively short amount of money um, and basically uh, in a short amount of time been able to produce something that is uh, worthy, that is transnational and distributed by NPR. Uh, that would have been unthinkable a decade earlier. Um, and each, all of these have embraced commercial practices despite being in the field of public radio. All of these are brands in their own right. And when you speak to each of these people, they think of themselves as brands and they think of their uh, podcasts as brands and their programs as brands. They're very, very savvy when it comes to marketplace dynamics. Uh, Maria you know, Jose is, is a brand in and of its own right and she she protects that brand. Um, and so all of these folks have embraced commercial practices. You know, there's kind of a, a byproduct of that, um, meaning that at one point there was meant to be a distinction between public radio and commercial radio. Public radio is meant to be an alternative to commercial radio. Today, you know, just again, the possibilities and, and the changes in the marketplace, there's more stuff out there, but that that distinction between public and commercial radio has diminished, right? In some cases, it's almost difficult to tell. Um, and so when you go on to many of these NPR stations, you'll hear things like, um, you know, the New York Times um, Daily, uh, the New Yorker Radio Hour, um, all of these things are commercial enterprises, but they find themselves on public radio. And so you have more stuff out there that that sounds remarkably similar. Uh, but the true mission of, of NPR and public radio is, is, you know, in that kind of context, it's becoming less and less um, certain. There was sort of a podcast, the, the one kind of thing about writing about any kind of, of public media system uh, or any kind of media system in general is that it takes about two seconds for things to change. But I think there were some sort of interesting developments that happened, you know, at the end of the year that this book was, um, uh, that came out. And really just the, the mass exodus of high profile journalists of color. Adi Cornish left to CNN, uh, Sam Sanders left for other opportunities, Lulu Garcia Navarro left for the LA Times. Uh, Maria Hinojosa left uh, NPR for um, for PRX. Um, so these different kinds of of uh, journalists that were high profile left NPR for other other opportunities. And in some ways that that presents some hope, uh, some opportunities. It also kind of shows the struggle that NPR is seeking to have um, in retaining journalists of color. But it's interesting to find out who many of these folks are going to. You know, again, they're going to commercial media, CNN, The New York Times. Uh, these are commercial properties, which again shows the, the possibilities that are out there. But it also shows you that um, that NPR is, is still kind of um, kind of struggling with its role as a commercial media system. You know what makes it different from public radio. Um, and so NPR, it was interesting to see how they they addressed it, which is that they didn't. You know they had some internal forums. Uh, there was some dialogue. Uh, you know there's always a, a come to Jesus meeting uh, or, or conversation that happens. But really, no change happens. You know, whatever kind of change happens, 
And this isn't the only time, you know, NPR has had conversations around uh, race. You know, every so often, you know, every 10 years or so, if not even sooner, um, NPR will have to confront his issue of its lack of diversity in the newsroom uh, and its coverage. And it's almost caught in this perpetual cycle of, okay, we acknowledge it. We have some discussion about it. There might be some cosmetic changes. Maybe they'll hire a producer here or a correspondent there, uh, or they'll place a, um, you know, some sort of staffing changes. But there's never any true discussion of the thing itself and changing the thing itself or changing the proposition. It is a large organization and it is, uh, in some ways they do what large organizations do. They're conservative, they're resistant to change. Um, and so I think, suspect that any kind of change that you see might be cosmetic, but there's not gonna be much to, um, to kind of what they what they actually offer. Um, I guess the last kind of thing that, that I'll point out and, and would love to, to hear your perspectives or open it up is, Kind of how diversity plays out on radio than how it does maybe in, in magazine or, or other visual kinds of medium. You can have diversity without having diversity. Uh, so you can have people with Spanish surnames uh, or um, you know different color uh, phenotypes. But if the voice is the same, you're not really having diversity. And I guess the example that I would use uh, would be A. Martinez, who's who's now host of Morning Edition. Uh, I had an interview, had the chance to interview him when he was in uh, Southern California, KPCC. Uh, and before that, he started off in, in sports radio. What's interesting is to watch how his voice has changed over time in order to meet the broadcast standard. Um, you know, in sports radio, he was bombastic. You know, that was the nature of that kind of genre. He spoke in, in a, a kind of a wider range. When I spoke to him as host of, of um, Take Two uh, in Los Angeles, you know, he had expressed some frustration about that, that he had to be very controlled and very measured uh, because he was speaking to, you know, as, as he described at the time, this snooty, elevated way, you know, to appeal to his audience. Um, after writing the book, he ends up becoming a key figure in Morning Edition. So he's now one of those hosts. Um, and his voice has even become more like the NPR standard, uh, different than it was in LA and certainly different than it was as a sports um, broadcaster. But to see the evolution of his voice to get to that point um, suggests that there's, a, you know, pretty uh, strong gravitational pull towards sameness. Uh, when it comes on NPR. Um, I guess the other thing that 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 example points to is which properties um, allow for different kinds of linguistic range. Where are ethnic voices allowed to be uh, in shows like this? And I think when you talk to about NPR's flagship programs, all things considered in Morning Edition, uh, they're, they're pretty conservative. Uh, you're not going to see a huge range of, of linguistic variety. You might see some more on, on things like code mix, uh, identity-based programs that are deemed sort of uh, relevant for um, kind of ethnic voices. Uh, Latino is another one of those spaces where you're going to hear some Spanish accented voices, but they seem to be kind of cleanly contained within, within the NPR system. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's it's a script that's been written. I think there's been some promises and, in, in, you know, discouragement in doing this kind of project. I think probably the, the thing that strikes me is how much hasn't changed over the course of 50 years. Like we keep having this conversation about the need for inclusivity and the need for greater voices, but we never quite seem to get there. Um, I'm hopeful that that the, there are disruptions that will force NPR uh, to, to have to pivot. Um, but, you know, it's, it is in some cases discouraging to see how little change has happened uh, over time. So I guess that, that concludes my formal part of the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you know, someone asked in the chat, and for full transparency, I used to work for NPR, and someone asked whether or not this was something that I dealt with. And quite frankly, uh, could you unshare your screen? Yes, sorry. Um, quite frankly, it is something that I dealt with. It is something that uh, there were let's say opportunities to undergo voice training and coaching and attempt to sort of perhaps change the register of my voice. Um, but uh, if there are any questions, please get those Zoom hands up and then we'll get to you. But I want to continue the conversation with Chris a little bit further. And that is in your presentation, you talked about this issue of um, Choosing a, a tone or a type of voice means that you're choosing an audience and you're choosing who not who won't be your audience. As a, a fascinating concept for me. 
And so when I think of the the progression of NPR and, and how it's changed and, and or not changed through the years, and you see the departure of people going off to do their own thing or join other outlets, I wonder if we've reached a point where uh, NPR may be saying this market segmentation thing is is just really where we are, and and these are the people who who donate. These are the people who. Um, listen to us the most and they're the majority so far at least until 2055 or whatever in the country so i wonder if if that's really what we're looking at here a sense of people will go to other platforms to hear themselves and so we don't have to worry about it yeah i mean great point and i think in some ways it's it's a competition between short-term and long-term goals like short term, they don't want to lose listeners. They don't want to lose funding. You know, they're they're an organization and they want to stay viable, uh, and so they want to kind of protect that listener that that is more affluent that is giving money. The problem long term is that well, that audience is getting older and older and older. Uh, and so when you look at NPR, it's wide, it's disproportionately wider, and it's disproportionately older. Uh, meanwhile, the the listening audience is getting younger and more diverse. And so they know they have to get to that point. They just they don't know how, or they're not willing to kind of make the short term concessions in order to get to that long-term point. But it's it's a losing proposition long-term, just the demographic will age itself out. Uh, and NPR at that point will have to reinvent itself or pivot. And, and I agree, like I think they, there hopefully is pressures from alternatives in the marketplace. You know, there's some really brilliant podcasts that are out there that are in some ways out NPRing, out NP, NPR. You know, they're doing it, you know, they're telling more relevant stories with diverse kinds of people, you know, more uh, human and well done. Um, and so that's the hope is that external pressures can cause NPR to change. Um, but at this point, they, they've seemed pretty resistant to that. Can I see a show of Zoom hands? How many of you regularly listen to public radio? So quite a few folks. Uh, Heba, I see your, your actual Zoom hand raised. So let's start with you. Hi, um, Professor Chavez. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I am a producer at NPR um, at Weekend Edition. So I've this is my bread and butter, right? Um, and I've worked closely with Lulu Garcia Navarro. Now I work with Aisha Roscoe. Of course, I work with the legends as well, like Scott Simon and such. So um <clears throat> It's, it's so interesting. I'll give a couple of like little anecdotes that I think can totally jive with exactly what you've said. So it's, it's funny. Like I, I remember there was this distinct moment. So we do this thing now within NPR where we do source tracking, right? Where we actually sit down and we started this at Weekend Edition, actually, where we would sit down, look at the show and be like, okay, all the people that we booked, what are their demographics, right? And that gave us a very clear picture of like who we were actually bringing on to the show. And this is outside of like our own reporters and, you know, things like that. So uh, it's interesting because that gave us a starting point, I think, and that's something I think I would encourage like all of my colleagues to do is to like, if you actually want to see whether or not you're diversifying your sources is to actually look through your stories and keep track. And I remember there was this one distinct, um, we, we sit down every Sunday and go through the shows and, uh, you know, we get feedback on Twitter and stuff and somebody had said, um, uh, didn't realize that Weekend Edition Sunday was like, there's so many Latinos on the show. And we were like, oh, like, okay, like, you know, let's fact check this claim. We looked at it and we we're like, there were three Latinos on the show, right? One of which, which was Lulu, who hosts the program. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because, and I bring this up and now we have Aisha Roscoe as the host of Sunday. And she has a, she has a very different voice, right? She has a voice that is informed by her North Carolina background. And, um, and it comes through and that's why it's it's perfect right because that is when i think about we have this north star mission at the the company now that got, came in with our new ceo um about diversifying our audiences and diversifying our newsroom and in hopes because we understand i think there is an understanding within broadcasting that if we don't do it we will cease to exist um and I guess I guess the, it's just interesting because the feedback that we do honestly see is that oh like you know the show sounds unprofessional now or the there's too many why are people pronouncing things with the accent or da 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 um, I've had friends who are reporters being told by you know white editors that you need to can you tone down your Spanish can you tone down your 
pronunciation. I've had this crisis of pronouncing like my own name at the end of a piece, right? Because it sounds different than the way that the host pronounced it, right? Um, so it's interesting uh, like to see all of these things that are still very relevant and that the newsroom is very much grappling with. I guess um, I, one of the comment questions that I guess I have here is that, um, do we see evidence of, you know, we know that people are paying attention when they're listening, they're reacting, right? Um, if we do continue to diversify the voices on air, will that really bring in more diverse audiences? I would like to think yes, but I'm always curious to see what the data is, you know, because there are definitely initiatives within the newsroom that we, you know, I hear about now, for example, we're doing the possibly doing the State of the Union in Spanish. Like that's huge, you yeah. know? So things like that, I in I, I just I'm curious about that. Have you seen that data? Have you said that for, yeah? Yeah, so I know if there's a, a kind of a direct link between uh, language usage and, and audience generation, but you know there are other examples of other public radio networks that are much more um, kind of open to linguistic varieties. And so um, PRI International would be the, the clear example from, they're gonna leave large amounts of testimonies that are in some cases untranslated. You're likely to hear people with Southeast Asian accents, with uh, Guano accent, Puerto Rican accents, and it works, right? I, I think we don't oftentimes give the audience enough credit for being exposed to different kinds of voices, right? And in some ways, I think NPR kind of coddles that. Um, you know, again, I think there are cases where you're going to isolate viewers, you know, that don't like hearing accented voices on on air. Uh, but the hope is that you get people that that will, right? That see themselves or hear themselves uh, in those kinds of voices. Um, I love the fact that Aisha Ross goes on there, and and I agree with you. Like that is progress. Um, Lulu Garcia Navarro came up quite a bit, and so did Ani Cornish. Uh, and in her case, is really interesting. Lulu is because she's she's multilingual, right? She she's fluent in Spanish, in English, I think in French as well. Um, but she only, at least on her time on NPR, could only deliver her broadcast in English, right? So whatever Spanish language skills that she had were underutilized completely. Uh, and what she did, you know, produce something that a name that was in Spanish. Uh, and she's written about this. She'd get corrected by the audience, right? They would they would make a point to tell it, and she would have to defend that on on Twitter. Um, so you know, again, I think with with many of us, right, we come with a wide range of linguistic skills, but we only get to use such a narrow portion of that, and it seems like a wasted opportunity, right? It, it's a resource uh, rather than a deficiency. Yeah, that's a good point, Heba. I think that the you know everything. Is these days are so evidence-based. You know, we want proof that if we do this, we're going to get a result. And what I worry, uh, Chris, is th that NPR has had this reputation for so long that even if they do make a, a relatively significant effort in the next few years, uh, it's, it's a missed opportunity. Do you agree with that? I agree. You know, I interviewed uh, a woman, Gisela Regato, uh, who she she's you know was producing a piece at NPR and she's from Brazil and it speaks with a slight Brazilian accent and was told that she couldn't um, kind of she wasn't right for the piece because of her voice and this was at NPR and then she goes to PR International and it's a very different experience there she she will not go back to NPR like she she said I will not I will not work with them right they don't respect my voice uh, they don't respect where I kind of fit within the construct of, of what it means to be American. Um, and so she, I think it has been off-putting to some professionals and, and then even some listeners. Um, I believe I saw Mina's hand and then Gabrielle. So Mina, are you still there? Oh, no, I was just raising my hand when you asked for a census poll. So Gabby can go ahead. Okay, Gab. Hi, uh, Christopher. My name is Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a reporter from PolitiFact, and I've also been a huge fan of NPR um, for a very long time. In college, I interned uh, at WDET, which is the Detroit uh, NPR station, for almost my entire time there. <laughs> um, so I'm a huge NPR fan, and also wanted to say I love Aisha Rasko. Um, and I do wonder, and also, even though, uh, even though I know that she is of Caucasian descent, but Eleanor, um, gosh, and please forgive me for forgetting her last name, but she's the Paris correspondent for NPR, and she has a, a thick Southern ask accent, and that's not common at all, you know. And I, I love to hear that um, because it sounds like pieces of home. 
you know, Beardsley, thanks. Yeah, Eleanor Beardsley. Uh, it, you know, it sounds like pieces of home. I'd love to hear her and uh, Aisha as well. And so I listen to NPR, but I listen more so to the podcast version of it. So Invisibilia, and that's where I see the diversity is, but that's in the scope of podcasts, not necessarily on the mainstream when you turn on the radio. But I'm also noticing that um, in that same turn, there's more diversity on the podcast end, but there's also uh, a younger generation as well, millennial and Gen Z. And so I wonder if by bringing that into the mainstream, and I guess this is more of a comment than a, a question, but I would hope that they would bring that more onto the on-air side of things so that you're not only reaching more diversity, but you're also reaching more generations as well. And that's a really astute point. You know, when you look at podcasting, it opens up huge possibilities, you know, one, because it's relatively cheaper to produce and you can tell different kinds of stories. And if we look at with our, their offerings, it's so much more uh, inclusive. Um, most of that stuff will never make it to um, uh, to the on-air terrestrial experience. The other thing about that is, is who, you know, not all podcasts, you can create one, but but to promote it and distribute it to actually support it is a whole other thing, right? And so um, this is one of the critiques that Maria Hinojosa had about her program. And it's one of the reasons why she decided to leave is that she had this, this offering um, that was available to some stations, but she never felt that NPR supported it, promoted it, distributed it in the way that she thought it should be. And she, it took her to go to an alternative network, PRX, to actually kind of get the kind of funding and promotion and support that she thought she would. Um, so I think there are, there are huge possibilities with the digital platforms. Uh, but yeah, there's there's sort of an incongruency between what you kind of hear on the radio, um, you know, on air live, and then the podcast realm. And, and if they could just sort of make better use of that, gosh, you know, that could really go a long way. Yeah, but I saw in your comment, you said that even though you went to school for broadcast reporting, you wanted to be able to sound like yourself. So tell us a little bit about what you experienced in terms of people coaching you or trying to get you to speak a different way. Yeah, um, I wanted to sound like me, which is at times maybe nerdy and squeaky, and that's fine, but I wanted to. Um, that was one of the things that I saw wasn't authentic. The more I learned about uh, traditional broadcast television, and I'm sorry because I know we have broadcast journalists here, and I don't mean to offend. I think you guys could do it 10 times better than I ever could, and that's another reason why I'm not, <laughs> why I'm on the digital side of journalism now. But um, Oftentimes than not, there was a broadcast voice that if I wanted to present a particular story, I felt that I was in a box and I couldn't really be creative. And so that was something that um, told me, okay, maybe I need to go more of the online route where I can. I mean, I still do video reporting um, at PolitiFact, but we're able to be a little bit more creative. And so it feels a little more freeing. Um, but that was that was one of the main reasons why I decided that perhaps the traditional broadcast wasn't for me. Um, and again, I think that broadcast journalism is hard. You know, you guys don't get enough credit for what you do. So, um, you know, how do you for I guess uh, as a question for broadcast journalists, maybe I'm putting you guys on blast. You know, how does that feel being in in your newsroom right now? Um, you know, does it feel normal to kind of speak in that it's a very, it's a very uh, affirmative turn, um, tone, excuse me, but what does that feel like? I'm going to put Brittany on blast because <laughs> um, your tone, the timber, whatever you want to call it in your voice is very uh, authoritative to me. I mean, you speak and, and mine is just too deep. I'll be honest, half the time when I call people on the phone, they think I'm a man, so whatever. But uh, for you, in terms of your training and your journey in broadcast, um, I would imagine that you haven't had a lot of people tell you that you need to change your voice because your natural voice is so authoritative. Is that correct? It is. And it's. I think I've just had a different journey than some other people. Um, and like we talked about in our call, I didn't really have a mentor. Um, and so when I started out, I started in, in Utah. And I think it also has a lot to do with 
our station was just like, get it on the air. <laughs> you know, we, we just need to fill the hole and all that kind of stuff. So it was just like, there was really no feedback. It was just sound, just get the story on, you know? And I would say, and I would always, that's something that I would um, always wonder about was my voice because I know that I did not sound like the traditional, I guess, broadcast anchor voice, whatever. And, you know, I would ask about that and it was just, you're fine. You're fine. Stick to yourself. Your voice is different, but it's, it's whatever, um, you know, just, you don't change it. Um, so that was kind of, if I had some feedback, that was it. It was just continue doing yourself, continue doing what you do. Um, your voice, it is different, but just go with it. Um, and then I would go to NABJ and I would always ask people there because that's where I would get a lot of feedback. And I would ask, well, what about my voice? And then somebody would say, don't change your voice. Your voice is different. And that's what is going to make you, you know, kind of stand out from the crowd. And sometimes I wouldn't even bring it up. And somebody would ask me, did you have any voice lessons, any voice coaching or anything? And I'm like, no, I'm just out here doing me. And they would just say, you know, don't change it. Um, and I'm just like, all right, I don't know what I'm not going to change, what I'm going to change. I'm just going to continue doing, you know, what I'm doing. And I think I just, I don't know if I just got lucky. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, because I know that a lot of people do have to go through voice training and have been asked to change the way that they speak or their tone. Um, so I, I don't know if it had to do with where I was and we were the last PlayStation and they were just like, whatever, get the stuff on. <laughs> um, but now where I'm at as well, it's a very much kind of environment where it's do you as well. We, we have a very supportive, um, we, our managers are very supportive and it's sound the way you sound, don't change anything. And, um, what's also interesting is we have a, um, bilingual reporter, and the topic for her has come up lately where it's been like, and she wouldn't mind me sharing this, um, but it it's come up where, how do you pronounce certain cities? Do you pronounce them the Spanish version, how, they, how they're supposed to be pronounced? Or do you pronounce them the way we say it in California? Um, and so it's interesting when you bring up, you know, about the viewers, because some viewers will be like that. I, that accent, like it's too much. I can't understand. But then it's like, oh no, we, we love that. We enjoy that. And our boss has also said, no, this is why you were hired. So you continue speaking the way that you speak. It's a, uh, Gabby has just made this point is because you sound like yourself. You sound like the way you speak on screen and off screen. So I guess the lesson for me is I could have been the black Barbara Walters if I had not been on NPR. So anyway, uh, Chris, I want to bring you back into this conversation and ask you, what kind of, uh, do you advise some of your students about this issue? How do you talk to journalism students about what they need to expect or what they could expect in that area? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to just prepare them for the kind of the realities of it that, and again, like this is unique in some ways to NPR. They're pretty conservative when it comes to voices. I think there are other news outlets that might be more open to them. So, you know, when I, I try to, you know, tell them to be authentic, but there, there are risks to it. Um, and that's sort of the professional reality. I, I remember hearing, and it was heartbreaking for me, it was a local correspondent at, um, you know, Oregon Public Broadcasting. And, and she she said, in, in, in straightforward way, she's like, and she was Peruvian and she speaks with a Peruvian accent. And she said, man, I wish I would have taken an accent reduction course. That, would, that really would have done wonders my career. Uh, but because she speaks in an accent, she's she's relegated to the digital realm. Uh, her voice rarely gets to be heard on um, on air. Um, you know, you have to kind of search for it. And she recognizes that 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 has been a limitation for her. So, you know, I just try to be honest with with students that, you know, that the the industry is pushing this way. Not that you should do that, but just just be aware and, and you try to navigate and hopefully make the choices that uh, that are going to be good for you. If are there any more questions? Do I see any more? Uh, let me go to gallery view. Uh, Mabinti. Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Chavez. I remember when your book came out, and I can't quite remember the year, but I remember reading an article about it. 
and it talked about <laughs> what I remember and forgive me if I'm remembering it wrong. But what I remember is that like top NPR leadership, I think they didn't speak to you or I think they like, and I, I just, what I wanted to ask is like, I know you mentioned, like I talked to the founders and him writing his mission statement and you mentioned talking to the hosts, but did you talk to actual NPR executives about this? Did they respond? Were they helpful? Did they have any sort of insight into why things are? Yeah. And uh, so, no, I mean, I, there, the interview that I wish I would have gotten would have been Lulu Garcia Navarro, you know, just because her name came up so often. Um, and in some ways, I'm not sure if, if even if I spoke to leadership, that that would have been helpful. Uh, you know, I think the leadership is inclined to, to do what it's going to do, which is to protect the organization, which is what they should be doing. So I'm not sure if I would have gotten necessarily um, anything insightful there. So, so no, I mean, I guess that, that would be the answer. <laughs> Raphael. Well, Ooh, actually, oh, go but Rinty, do you want to finish up? Well, yeah, I just, well, is that indicative of like how unserious they are about these efforts, right? It's one thing to to say we care about diversity, but if you're not talking to someone who actually studies it and then they're not being helpful, what kind of signal does that send? Right, yeah. And, um, you know, what I was looking at is just sort of the historical sort of historical record of it, you know, what has it has it done over time? Um, and there are, you know, what I did find, you know, because there are sort of formal press releases that they put out, there are statements they put out specifically through their ombudsperson that articulate sort of the institutional point of view. Um, but there are disparities, right, between what they they say they they stand for and what they they actually do. Raphael. Uh, mine is not necessarily a question, but also just kind of an experience, um, because I think something what we've been discussing kind of happened to me. I began in TV. And so my senior year, um, I did his fellowship at a local TV station. And one of the local, uh, one of the their main anchors, um, she kind of looked at my my reel and gave me some feedback. And one of her first critiques was that my accent was too heavy and that I should work with like a like a coach to kind of get rid of it or to kind of like lessen less uh lessen like the the accent. And so I feel like I remember that kind of giving me like a lot of anxiety because that was also the time when I was starting to apply for a lot of jobs. And so I kind of felt like that that was kind of hinder me. Um, in terms of finding a job. Um, and ultimately, what I thought was really funny about it all was that I ended up getting a job in South Texas, where I think 95% of the, the people who live there sound and look like me. And so um, I just thought it was interesting that it ended up being that way. But then even then, um, when I was working in South Texas, um, there's a lot of uh, winter Texans well, here in Arizona, we call them snowbirds, which is people who come from up north um, to spend like the winters down south. And um, I remember getting feedback from some of them who would know about how much my English was improving, um, which I thought was really interesting because, I mean, I've been speaking English pretty much all my life. Um, and so like those comments I thought were really, um, in a way they kind of, they stuck with me because, you know, they just kind of stand out um, as something that like um, really wasn't expecting to, to hear. But I also think that over time, um, you know, the more, especially being as a young reporter, um, the more time that you spend doing it, the better you get at it. Um, you know, I kind of got into the rhythm of finding things that worked for me and 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 doing things that that you know just ended up you know working out well and did have the support of of my editors, which I think is being uh, you know discussed in, in in the chat. And I think that that was pretty instrumental too in kind of giving me that confidence to to kind of continue with that. But I think that those comments definitely stuck um, with me, and you know even to this day, kind of still remember them um, because I think it's especially as a young impressionable reporter like that, it, it really caused like so much anxiety, kind of like debating my future, like, should I do TV? Should I do something else instead? And ultimately, you know, kind of glad that I had that experience, but um, just kind of wanted to share that anecdote as well. I have to say your uh, podcast voice is, in, I mean, it sounds like you, but it's really incredible. Great, great uh, delivery. Before I give Chris the, the final word and uh, to ask you to share your final message, I want to read Heba's comment because it's so powerful. She says, I've gotten the courage finally to be like, if you want me to pronounce this differently, then you should have hired, asked someone else to report or produce this element. You don't get just get parts of us. You get all of us, our voices, our accents, and our knowledge, et cetera. So Chris, leave us with a, a thought uh, or something to consider moving forward about this issue. Yeah, I mean, I guess two things. Uh, you know, one is thank you all for the work that you're doing and and what you're going to bring and how you're going to change the industry. 
Uh, and thank you, Rachel, for for all the work that you're doing to help kind of facilitate this and support this. But um, I just, I'm just really impressed by what you bring to the table and the kind of the possibilities that it means for for news. Um, I am hopeful. You know, I, I know kind of the tone of the the studies is you know um, doesn't seem optimistic all the time. But we're you know we're living at a really interesting moment of demographic change and technological change. And I'm interested to see how you take advantage of it. I, I think that that your generation of journalists has, in some ways, more options than than other generations. Um, and I'm looking at it again specifically from the, the um, public radio kind of pipeline. Um, you know, back in the day, there was just one pipeline, and so there was always a logjam because people that got into public radio stayed there, uh, and so that means that a new, diverse, um, you know, talented. Uh, journalists could not get into, cannot break ground. It was very, very difficult to break ground. Uh, because you have more properties now, uh, there are opportunities to kind of go outside the public radio system, go back to the public radio system. Um, Jasmine Gars, I think, is a, is a pretty good example of that. You know, she started off as an intern, uh, goes to the BBC for a while, um, goes to Marketplace, back to NPR. Uh, so she's had a circuitous route. But, you know, back days old, those options wouldn't have been available to her. And she's navigated her career quite nicely. Christopher Chavez, thank you so much for joining Widening the Pipeline today, and we will definitely uh, usher you into the Widening family as well. I hope to work with you again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.